Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I'm privileged to be able to speak to you tonight, so thank you for being here. It's my turn, so I can say what I want. How is everybody? You okay? I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about lessons in love. Um, we have elected in the process of um, uh, redefining our purpose and, and vision and the way that we do things to uh, cover for a few weeks the elements that you find in our launch video, which are really the expression of our heart and they are the building blocks of, um, of this house and, and what we are seeking to achieve and where we're heading. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about lessons in, in love. Um, I can't say to some degree it's my favorite subject because uh, it sounds like something good to talk about in church, but it's not that easy actually. So I'll do my best, is that all right? And I'll let God help me with the rest. Um, so one of, one of the, one of the um, statements in our confessional video is love is felt, received, and done. Now what's fascinating is we've released our um, uh, relaunch video and, and uh, specifically highlighted the things that are important to us, how different ones of you uh, express some conflict or confusion with different elements in there because you're not quite sure what they mean. For some of you, it's because you're not listening. <laughs> and others of you, it's very genuinely because your reference point in life does not at this moment allow you to embrace those things. They're okay as statements, but when you ha once you have to embrace them, uh, it becomes a little more difficult. So I want to, as a reference point, use some some elements from a message I already preached some months ago, but it's important to help me today to get across to you what I want to say about lessons in love. And uh, the verse that I want to use in the New Testament in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter 13 is verse 13. And uh, that verse says these words, <clears throat> and now these three remain. Um, once you insert the word remain into a conversation, it means that something must have been taken away. Okay, do you get that? Okay. For something to remain, you had to have removed something. Now this is fascinating because this scripture was written by a guy called Paul the Apostle who was pretty significant in the development of the early church after Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, but he makes this statement that when you strip away everything that's just stuff in the Christian gospel, in the Bible message, in the church project, you're left with only three things. And these are the three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. In other words, Paul is saying it would be so easy in this emerging thing called the church, the body of Christ, the way, the followers of Jesus, to become totally tied up with all kinds of detail that may be important detail, but it is not significant to the real grasp of what the message is all about. So I have to say that in, in my lifetime, spending so many years, the church at large, whether it's this kind of church or that kind of church or another kind of church, is full of stuff. And I don't mind the stuff. I don't mind how people worship. I don't mind whether it's liturgy. I don't mind whether it's silence. I don't mind whether it's louder, whether it's quiet, whether it's hymns or whether it's songs. I really don't mind. What I do care about is when you strip all that away, can you find that these three things remain in the message, in the people, in the culture, faith, hope, and love, and that when you find those three, that the greatest of them is not faith, and the greatest of them is not hope, but the greatest of them is love. 
I've been intrigued this week that we don't get to live life to a music soundtrack. Now, it would help. I don't know if you've noticed it, but whenever you watch TV or you watch a movie, subconsciously you are not aware that your emotions are being helped by the soundtrack. So if it's a love scene, you're not going to play uh, Benny Hill's... Doesn't work, does it? And likewise, with Jaws, if you played Beethoven's Fifth, it's not going to work. But you, when you play... You're scared just by the music. You know, you just... Your heart, your mind goes to an expression. Now, unfortunately, in life, we don't get a soundtrack to go with what is happening. In fact, most of life feels more like a, um, uh, more like a David Attenborough documentary. And now she is being stalked. <laughs> Watch as the creature stealthily moves through the wood. And she is unaware that it is approaching. And then it launches with great power and eats her. <laughs> and not a scrap remains. It often seems that our, our life is more like a David Attenborough documentary about the wildness of nature than it is a story where the music is helping us. But you see, I believe the message of the gospel is the music to support the process of life that helps set the mood for us to fully understand what it is to be a revolutionized, transformed human being in the love of God. So if we're not listening to and hearing the true gospel, that it should sound like music to our ears because it welcomes us. We're always welcome. So what if you are unclear or unable to feel, receive, and do what love is? What if? What if you don't know what you're supposed to feel? Because I can tell you God loves you. But what if you don't know what you're supposed to feel? What if you, you're unable to to feel what it is that you think I'm wanting you to feel or that you think the music wants you to feel or, or to receive or, or, or do what love is. What if our understanding of love is through the experience of childhood and life? That's why so many of us have different levels of ability to perceive love, to engage with love, to understand love, um, to submit to love, to accept love because our childhood and experience has often shaped us so some of you that are struggling it's not your fault that you don't know how to feel this but if we can understand something has shaped that and maybe break through that by a process that I want to talk about then maybe just maybe just maybe uh, you will find an experience this wonderful love that we're talking about I would also suggest that the lack of love Tainted love or misdirected love are at the root of all our distorted con concepts of life. See, we think that we're looking for lots of things, but actually we're not. We're looking for one thing. What we're looking for is to be loved. Now, we don't always use those phraseologies. We may talk in terms like, I just want to be understood. I just want to be accepted. I just want to feel as though I belong. I just want to feel secure. All those are simply branches of the tree that the root is love. They're all expressions that saying, I want to be loved. I want to be loved. I want to feel love. I want to know love. I need to find this love that goes beyond where I am. So at the root of all of us, actually, love is our quest. And we express it in many different ways. Sometimes our inability to connect with that love drives us into all kinds of, of addictions and compulsions. And you say, well, why does that person drink too much? Why does that person take drugs? It's because what we are looking for, we can't find, and so we medicate ourselves. Why do we medicate ourselves? Because we want to feel something, even if what we feel is numb, so we don't have to face the fact that we can't feel this thing that I would define to you is love. 
That's why the Bible says God is love. When you feel true love, you actually feel God. You may not know it's God. You may not understand that it's God. But when you feel true love, you feel God. Some, some, some people look for it between the sheets of a bed with a lover or many lovers or a male lover or a female lover or a transgender lover or whatever kind of lover it is. But actually what we're looking for is not to find our identity. We're actually looking for love. And uh, where we think we found love, we are so often drawn. I've always found it fascinating in, in Christian ministry that when you talk to a woman who gets beaten by her husband, she will keep telling you, yes, but I know that he loves me, really. Why are you going back? Because I know that he loves me, really. God, news for you, no, he probably doesn't. He is in love with somebody, but that somebody is not you. That somebody is himself. And when you get in the way of that, we, we, we also, incidentally on that point, try to medicate our need for love with self-love. Which is why so many people want to be reality stars. To feed the ego, because we've got to find the kind of love we're looking for, and if necessary, we, we'll, we'll make it that we love ourselves. All these are tainted and distorted ways of experiencing love and misdirected and they're at the root of all our distorted concepts of life. If you get the love thing right, you get life right. We may not realize it, but how we see love dictates how we see life. It's kind of the program running in the background all the time that never gets switched off. And so how we, how we see love dictates how we see life. Uh, it's interesting on those things as well that even questions that don't seem to be about that expose things in our life. For example, uh, I've been around in the Christian church a long time and one of the things I've heard many times is God has a plan for your life. You will never hear a more destructive statement then God has a plan for your life. So what, how is that destructive for this reason? That if you're wired a certain way, it says to you, there is a plan, there is one plan. It is your responsibility to find that plan, and if you do not find that plan, you will miss the plan. And that the way that you are loved is according to your ability to find the plan and outwork the plan. So your whole attempt is to, to find the plan, live the plan, believing that God will love you if you live in the plan, then he will, won't love you if you won't. Now, the reason I say that our upbringing, our childhood, some of you in your homes have been raised that way. Your subconscious perception of love is if I do what I'm supposed to do, I'll be loved. If I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I won't be loved. Now, we don't say it in those words, but I know that many of you in here tonight think, if I do certain things, God won't love me anymore, or his love will diminish. But if I do other things, God will love me lots, and his love will increase. That is a lie from the pit of hell, wherever hell is, whatever hell is, and if it's a pit, it's a lie from there. So you will not hear me say God has a plan for your life. I like what Joel said when he spoke on the scripture that refers to that. And he talked about how in the original it's God has thoughts for your life. He has thoughts for your life. It's good to get into God's head and let God get into your head. Because the thoughts he has for you will always make you prosper. Always make you successful. Always make you blessed. Now it doesn't mean there won't be hardship but that's the end. God always talks about what he sees not what you see. You talk about what you see, he talks about what he sees. You see yourself sick, he sees yourself well. You see yourself not succeeding, he sees you succeeding. And he wants you to get into his head and him to get into your head so that, so that that can change in you. God has a plan for your life, God forbid. God loves you. And the plan is, I'm going to love you whatever. You can't cheapen my love. And you can't, you can't build my love. All you can do is accept my love because it's never going to change. In your worst moment, God loves you the same as he loves you in your best moment. 
And in your best moment, he loves you just the same as he did in your worst moment. So the objective is not how do I obtain this love of God? How do I put myself in a place where I can understand it and receive it? The truth is that submission thing that, you know, God loves me. Do you know what my greatest understanding of the love of God has been? When I've done something that was incredibly stupid and I know it was really wrong and realized God still loved me the same after I did it as he did before I did it. That's how I understand love. Another thing as well from that uh, thinking and how we're raised. Be still and know that I am God is a wonderful verse in scripture. We were talking about it in our leaders meeting week before last. Be still and know that I am God. If you were raised in a situation where you were an invisible child, that means that, that your presence was an inter- interference with the process and your views did not matter, that's an invisible child. So you were in the house, but you had to toe the line, you just had to go along, be, and, and you just, just do what you're told, and stay out of trouble, and, and those kind of children, some of you in here were raised that way, know to just keep out the way, keep mum and dad happy, and you'll be okay, because you know that the principle is that you're going to be hung for a lamb, and you'll be hung for a sheep, so whichever one you're going to get hung, so try and stay out of trouble, because the punishment will always be the same, and it distorts the view of God. So it seems strange that you have a verse that says, be still and know that I am God, but that means two things to two different groups in here. To some of us, it means just relax, chill, deep breath, it's okay. I've got this, you're all right. But to some of you, it means shut up, sit down, and do as you're told. Now, for some of you thinking, it can't possibly mean that, but that's because you weren't raised that way. But some of you in here today, when you're here, be still and know that I am God. You think God's saying, shut up, sit down, you're not entitled to an opinion, you told the line, you behave, because my love depends on whether you told the line, because I am God. Now, I believe that's a wrong way to view this verse, because I really do think it's God saying, chill out, settle down, it's okay, come on, deep breath. It's going to be all right. I've got this. I have got this. Love is the foundation principle to all of life. The base layer is not loving, but being loved. None of the pressure is on you. All of the responsibility is on God. True love... None of the pressure is on you. All of the responsibility is on the giver. Anything different to that is not true love. I will love you if is not true love. I will love you when is not true love. I will love you provided is not true love. But the love that God talks about is this wonderful word, unconditional, which means there are no conditions attached. Okay, none unconditional love so my concentration the base layer of love is never about me loving but it's about it's about being loved so so jesus closest disciple a guy called john said this he said this is what love is not that you love god but that god loved you that's what he says okay this is love Not that you love God, but that God loved you. Or in other words, all the responsibility in true love is taken by the giver, not the receiver. The recipient can receive, and the recipient can choose to love back, but the giver's love is not dependent on the recipient, even loving back. So true love is unconditional and without restraint. That means it can't be measured out like, I'll give you a little bit of love. There's no such a thing. So the question becomes, can you believe it? Can you accept it? Will you embrace it? So the three things which remain, faith, hope, and love, are actually the working process of a blessed life. I want you to have a blessed life, okay? I want you to have the very best that is possible for who you are, in this world and in this life, living in and under that wonderful love of God which transforms us, I want you to have the best of that 
blessing. And these three things which remain are the working process for the blessed life. The working process of what truly matters is not faith, hope, and love. It's actually the other way around. It's love, hope, and faith. These three remain faith, hope, and and love, but the greatest in lo- is love. Or in other words, how you understand them is the opposite way around. It starts with love, doesn't end with love. Now this is very important because there has come a distortion often in our personal message and in the church's message that says, if you will have faith, you will find the love of God. That's not correct. You can't faith your way into the love of God. But if you find the love of God, you will have faith. And that faith will not be in you. It won't be in stuff. It won't be in your job. It won't be in your salary. It won't be in your kids. It won't be in your wife. That faith will be in God himself. You are the source of my strength, the strength of my life. But you'll never find that until you embrace and submit to and take hold of the love of God. Everything else is religious stuff. And you will work yourself into the ground, and I'll tell you how you'll feel when you've done it. Guilty, condemned, and unworthy. Because it's a foolish project to try and become so good that you can impress God. How dumb is that? I've given up on it a long time ago. It's the dumbest thing you can do. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have character. You shouldn't be a good human being. It doesn't mean that you should have good values that respect others. But that's not the way to find the love of God. In fact, when you find the love of God, that changes everything, not the other way around. So the working process that matters is not faith, hope, and love. It's love, hope, and faith. Faith does not bring you to an experience of the love of God. Experiencing the love of God brings you to faith. Even that great seemingly ever-present problem called fear is not counteracted by greater faith, but by greater love. Uh, There's not one of us in here... Um, tonight who doesn't struggle with that, that horrible, troubling problem called fear. It, it, it crops its head up because such is the nature of human life and such is the human heart that, that we tend to become afraid. That, that's why one of the most common statements that are recorded of Jesus saying was, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? Because they get scared all the time. I do. Get afraid of people, get afraid of things that are said. And have to come back and realize that the answer to that is not right. Come on, just pull yourself together. And, you know, you can do that a little bit, but really you're playing games because all that happens is that fear pops out somewhere else. It's like a balloon. When you squeeze a balloon, while there's air in the balloon, it will pop out wherever it finds a gap. And fear tends to do that. It pops out wherever it finds a gap. You're not going to suppress it that way. But there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful verse of Scripture that says these words, and again, it's written by that guy, John, who understood something about the love of God. He said, there is no fear in love. So if you can find the place of love, you leave the place of fear. You don't overcome the fear by trying to fight the fear. You deal with the fear by coming to the place of love. The place of love for a child is where? How do children deal with fear? They come to mom, dad, or even better, grandma and granddad for a hug. Why? Because there's something in that embrace that says the love that I am surrounded by is greater than the fear that is opposing me. The reason you don't break the fear and why some of you deal with anxiety all the time is because you've not found the place yet of where you know that you are unconditionally and unreservedly loved and when you run back to that place in father's arms, in daddy's arms, you find that fear has lost its power. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. That doesn't mean your love has to be perfect. You just only need one party that's got perfect love. And that's God. 
Because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. That's why I'm keen tonight to draw you to this place of love. So, the product or the fruit of experience and love of God will show you whether you've experienced the love of God. And one of the reasons we're given these three things is because if you are encountering one, it will manifest in the next, which will manifest in the next. So it's like, if you really want to guarantee this is an apple tree, when the first apple comes on it, you think it's definitely an apple tree. The fruit. Jesus, who was incredibly wise, said by their fruits, not by their suits, by their fruits you will know them. So the issue is here that the fruit of experiencing and embracing the love of God then is the next step. The fruit of that is hope. Your heart becomes filled with hope instead of despair. Now hope is not the solution to the problem. It's the solution to your worry. Do you get that? Hope is not the solution to your problem. Hope is the solution to your worry. And the first step for all of us dealing with our worry is to find hope, which is the solution to our worry. Now, it doesn't mean we have to ignore the problem, but we need a solution before the problem is resolved. So love brings us into hope. When you begin to embrace the love of God and you enter into that and say, he loves me unconditionally and he loves me unreservedly and I will not resist that love. I am love whatever people say. I'm incredibly loved and he loves me whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm involved in, even though I'm trying to find ways to resolve this love in my heart and probably about to do some things that are really stupid. He still loves me just the same and guess what? When I've done the stupid thing and really at least this connected sequence, consequence, consequence. He'll still love me in the consequence. He'll still love me when I've been stupid. He'll still love me when I've broken some things and destroyed some things that I can't fix. He'll still love me the same. And when I enter that love, he'll fill me with hope that no matter what has happened, the last word has not yet been spoken. That's what hope does. Hope is the confident expectation that the last word has not yet been spoken. In the midst of despair, in the midst of failure, in the midst of terror and anxiety, when you embrace that love and hope rises up, all of a sudden you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not the oncoming train. You get a sense of this is not over. There's something that pulls you on. It's called Hope, and the Bible calls it the anchor for the soul. All of a sudden, instead of you floating around, you suddenly have an anchor, and that anchor is the hope that's come from the love. But then there's another verse in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that that says that faith makes substance. How many of you know what substance is? Substance is what you can feel and see. So that's substance. It's a bottle with water in it. Substance, which means because it's substance, I can handle it, I can feel it, I can use it, I can drink from it. Here's the promise of God. Faith will make substance, but listen, of the things that you hope for and will make evidence of the things that you have not seen. Once you have evidence, you can prove that what could not be seen is real. Is that a fact? Evidence proves that what you could not see is real. Here's what the Bible says, that faith takes that hope, that thing that's alleviated your anxiety, but it's not solved the problem, that Confident expectation, the last word has not been spoken. And faith somehow gets a hold of that, and faith turns that into substance. And it makes evidence of the things that you have not yet seen. It is a process to change your life to a blessed life. Because here's what the Bible says about faith. It says that about Abraham, so those who have faith are blessed. I like that word. Those who have faith are blessed. You never cursed when you have faith. You never stuck when you have faith. Those who have faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. So if we get this process right, we find that love in the midst of our 
anxiety in the midst of our distorted understandings and we embrace that unconditional, unrelenting love and hope begins to rise and then faith begins to grow around the hope and suddenly we find ourselves looking at blessing. We find ourselves looking at the way forward and the way out and the way up. Faith is the determined placement of belief and trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. That's what faith is. Faith is the determined placement of the belief and trust in the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you allow this love to embrace you and you begin to hope, your expectation in that context becomes in the goodness of God. You're now beginning to see that out of all this, there is goodness and there is faithfulness. Faith is a conduit for blessing. When you can't see the steps, faith lifts you to another level. When you can't see the steps, faith in the goodness of another lifts you to another level. Get your legs stretched because I'm using you again. See, when I can see the steps, I really don't need any faith. Because I can get to the next level because the steps are obvious. The problem is, much of the time in life for the things that matter, the steps are not there. Somebody stole the steps. And you find yourself having to get to another level in life, in emotion, in, in, in grace, in relationship, in, in, in your spiritual growth. And you can't get there because there are no steps. And what you need then is you need someone else to give you a lift up. Are you doing it here or do you want to do it where it's shorter there? Because you're not a really tall man, are you? No. So here, James can do this while ever I give him the help. But you see, him taking hold of me gave him what he needed to lift him to the next level. The problem often is you will not take hold of the one that you need to help you to get you to the next level, so you stay down here and spend all your life walking around. How am I going to get to the next level? Well, the truth is, without love, hope, and faith, you're probably not. You can walk around it as long as you like, but you ain't getting there because you don't know where the steps are. Now, actually, I could say the steps are love, hope, and faith. But this whole business of faith, I repeat it again, when you can't see the steps, faith in the goodness of another is what brings you to the next level. That's the process. Love wants to bring hope in your heart so that you'll see the goodness of another that's there to bring you to the next level, whatever the issues are, whatever you're facing in your life. So true hope is based in love, and true faith is what grows around hope. But here's what he says in verse 8 of that 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never fails. This is a process that if you embrace it will never fail. It's as eternal as the law of gravity or the law of lift. It will not fail. The law of love will not fail you. What you've got to do is get past some of those things that you drew from childhood and life and experiences to grab hold of this love, not love as you experienced it with your parents or love as you experienced it with your lover or your husband, your wife or whatever, but the kind of love that God is talking about. He wants to ambush you with the most incredible love. Which is why I'm glad we said at the beginning that when we do that, it means I surrender. I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to fight you. I realize that you're a greater power than I am. But I'm going to submit that as I surrender to you, you will treat me better than the Geneva Convention. Okay? You will actually bless me when I do that. So here's where I want to finish. Any love that ultimately leaves you less than is not real love. So any love that leaves you feeling 
less than is not real. Real love always loves you to the more than. And here's my killer verse to finish with, Romans 8, 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than. More than. True love always makes you more than. More than conquerors through him that loved us. That means you don't just get through, oh, I conquered my fears, I conquered that anxiety, I conquered that problem. This makes you more than a conqueror. You're not a survivor. You've now become an inheritor. You've become the master of your situation more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is always the process to make you more than. I'm not throwing out the love of God as some little pill to say, oh, well, you know, there's lots of things you could choose in the world, but why not choose the love of God? I'm saying that this is the thing that is the real thing that will always make you more than. Not less than, more than. It doesn't drain you, it resources you, it fills you in every way. It doesn't kill you, it gives you life. More than through him who loved us. The more than experience. Why? Because when you take away all the stuff, only three things are left that we have to sort out. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And if you're willing to start there, you will come to a place of being a more than conqueror through him who loves you. Let's pray just for a minute. Sometimes it it helps people just to um, make a make a move towards, make a move of acceptance. You know, it's, um, when a person offers a gift, it's, it's very difficult to receive that gift without accepting it, if you know what I mean. You know, in essence, the person stands there and the gift stays in their hand. Well, that's often what can happen with us because we just don't do what the human spirit needs to, to receive. So, Here's what I'd like to do. If, if, if something's touched you tonight, then you need to embrace and engage with this journey of the love of God, which is transforming. It transforms our life. Then I'd like you to do something real simple right now. I'd like you just to stand to your feet, because I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for the reality of this experience of the embracing arms of the love of God to touch you, to revolutionize your situation, to change you, to cause hope to spring up and faith to arise from that hope so that you become more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. What are you facing? Want to be more than a conqueror? This is the process. You are loved unconditionally and unreservedly, and I want you to receive that now. So the guys are going to sing in a moment, but I'd, I'd just like to pray for anybody that needs that. I'm not forcing anybody. I'm not going to push this. But if you'd like to make that step, just stand where you are, like everybody else, just heads bowed, eyes closed, just simply for people's comfort. I sometimes want to pray that that some of you will do something so ridiculously stupid that the only thing that can save you is an experience of the love of God. I won't do that because I'm I'm not malicious, but when you've been a person who's been in that position, you realize that sometimes that's the best place to be. Some of you that have been in the depth of despair, what a great place to be because that's the place where you can find the love of God the most when you come to the end of yourself... And you can't even love yourself anymore and you don't think anybody else loves you. It's a wonderful place to start. That God loves me so much that he made me his friend. So I want to pray over you right now. Father, over every person that stood right now, every single one, I just pray your loving arms will will be felt and experienced. 
that each heart here right now of these people who are standing will, will feel that grip, that tremendous grip of the love of God, which is so amazing and so wonderful, because in essence, it's you yourself. It's all of who you are gripping them, that out of that, a hope will arise, and a faith will take hold of the hope, and more than conquerors through him who loved us. I thank you that there is in this word tonight, freedom from all kinds of compulsions and age-old lifelong issues that are broken because of your love, because there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Thank you for your love. Thank you that it's real. Thank you for the strength of it. Thank you for it right now in each heart and in each life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a song and then... Uh, you are welcome to stay. We're celebrating a birthday tonight of two wonderful people, Claire's grandparents, and uh, we'd like you to stay and celebrate and enjoy that with us at the back tonight because we love you guys. Happy birthday. We're going to celebrate you. And so when the guys have finished, uh, last week Chris felt very vulnerable because it's like everybody goes quiet and she was left to say, you know, thank you, good night. No. we've laughed about that all week so I said I won't make you do that treasure tonight so after we've sung it's thank you and good night <laughs> oh it's love so
Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.